My guest today has a passion for literacy. Uh, his name is Matt Barden, and according to his website, only 13% of American adults can read complex texts, and more than half read below a sixth grade level. Matt Barden is on a mission to change that. He's the founder of Zinc Educational Services and Zinc Learning Labs, and Matt's an expert in literacy education, test prep, and strategies for transforming adolescents into their highest achieving selves. And he's also my guest today. So welcome, Matt, to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. Good to be here. Nice to meet you, Art. Glad uh, this this worked out. We had scheduled a day before, but life being what it is, it, it <laughs> we're here today. So <laughs> we're ready to rumble. <laughs> Before we get to know you and get to know all that you're involved with, uh, I like to uh, talk to my guests also about books and reading, which I'm a big fan of. Sounds like you are too. So I have to ask, what are you reading right now or uh, anything you'd like to recommend to us? Yeah. So, I mean, first off, I, I got to say, honestly, I, I'm an extremely slow reader. I hear mm -hmm. that from a lot of readers um, and it's sort of like being an above average driver. Um, it, 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 the fact is that if you very, I know people who read really fast and actually enjoy it, but most people who comprehend well actually read slowly. Um, but I, I can recommend, if, I don't read shockingly for someone whose life is dedicated to literacy. <laughs> I don't read, you know, a book a day or even a book a week or mm -hmm. sometimes a book a month, but, um, I went on a big Kapuscinski jag recently. Have you heard of Richard Kapuscinski? Mm -mm. Oh, okay. I not. Boy, are you lucky to hear this and your <laughs> listeners. So uh, a friend of mine turned me on to this guy. He was a Polish journalist in the late 20th century, international um, journalist for the Polish newspaper. And he's, um, you know, some of the stuff I think he kind of essentializes certain cultures. And for our eyes, it's um, not always totally cool, but he's a brilliant writer. The book I recommend, uh, both books I read by him were great, Travels with Herodotus, um, which loops in all of this ancient history and stories from Darius and uh, Persian Empire and all this stuff, um, and also his own experiences in various parts of the world. Um, and then the Shah of Shahs, which is about the revolution in Iran, and he was there, mm -hmm in 1980. And, um, I, you know, we all know a little bit about that, but then I got deeply engaged with that. I also just read um, Also a Poet by Ada Calhoun, which made a lot of best of end of the year lists. It's, it's a um, really fun read if you're interested in New York City or sort of downtown culture um, in, um, in the later half of the 20th century. It's about Frank O'Hara, the poet, and her father, Peter Sheldahl, who was an art critic. And then I got one more, which my wife is actually a writer, and she just mm. got an um, uh, advanced copy of a book called Monsters. Um, have you heard of this book? Maybe. It's about to come out, I think, and it's really interesting. Again, it's nonfiction. Okay. Um, I'm blanking on the writer's name, sorry. But um, Monsters refers to... Um, people like uh, Roman Polanski, um, you know, writers or artists, uh, Polanski, obviously a filmmaker, who are enormously talented, who you, you love their work, mm -hmm. but they were horrible human beings. And so she's exploring the ethics of, well, what do we do about that? You know, are we mm -hmm. just not going to look at Chinatown, you know, ever again? Yeah, because right. Um, it's unstinting in terms of looking at what they actually did or were accused of doing. So um, it's not for the squeamish that way, but uh, she's a beautiful writer and I always enjoy that. Kind of yeah. Thing. Yeah. That, that one sounds, that's one sounds really good. Yeah. yeah. I like for uh, Roman Polanski, I loved his film, uh, the pianist. I think, it, I think it was, um, it was a world war two film and it's about a, piano player kind of that's the recent one yeah right? that's one of his it's recent Adrian ones Brody. Yeah, yeah yeah it's a, a phenomenal film and then i later find out like i didn't know anything about the guy and then i uh -huh. went, oh oh yikes <laughs> yeah, yeah really how, how do i yeah. balance that now yeah <laughs> yeah yeah horrific stories and also his own life story is horrific you know his yeah. mother was killed in the holocaust his mm. um 
his his wife and unborn child were murdered by Charles Manson. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but I don't know. I I have a hard time wrapping my head around people doing the things he's apparently done. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I, I think I've, I'm going with you on the tangents here. <laughs> oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be an episode if we didn't get off topic. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I was, I was thinking you, you'd mentioned you're a, a slower reader. And I was just looking up this book I read last year called uh, The Pleasures of Reading by Alan Jacobs. Hmm. And it, it's um, it's all about encouraging you you to slow down and read and, and you know as you're reading the classics or reading whatever uh really i mean his point was just read we read whatever you're reading don't just be in a hurry to get through it but slow down and savor it uh and right. you can like you were saying become more of a comprehending reader yeah yeah and, and so yeah. that's yeah you're cheating I, me up here okay <laughs> well perfect <laughs> well speaking of all that uh you know, uh, someone who is very passionate about teaching literacy, what's uh, what's your life story? And how did you get to this point? I know you started off as a, a teacher in New York City. Uh, was it high school English? Yeah, I initially taught uh, high school English and then middle school, a lot of everything, but always my license was English. Um, so mm-hmm. I did that for several years. And um, then I became a tutor and as a teacher, it was always, um, I, I always could feel like at least half the class slipping away, you know, and and um, the mm-hmm. kids in the front row had their hand up and they were doing great. And it was always exciting, that uh, engagement and um, seeing them grow and learn and everything. But I also was keenly aware of like, I'm not really doing anything for the kids in the back row. And, Mm -hmm. and also that um, even the kids in the front row, it sort of felt like they were just doing their thing. And then as a tutor, you know, you're tasked with, first of all, you have the luxury of one-on-one. And so Mm -hmm. there's just a lot less that can hide. And um, if you really connect with your student, you can really move the furniture around. And gradually over the years, I, I came to realize this, um, real gulf between the the haves and the have nots in education mm-hmm. largely divide along literacy lines. And so there are kids who are not readers who manage to somehow do well in school. And I think even more so now, I think a lot of the state standards and stuff like the attempts to get it, everything pinned down to data um, have mm-hmm. unfortunately, um, I think they're well-intentioned, but they've kind of narrowed um, learning in certain ways that have made it mm-hmm. possible and also grade inflation simultaneously have made it possible for a lot of kids who just work hard and are nice people to do well, quote unquote, in school. But they have no idea what's going on because if you're right. not really comprehending when you read, um, it's just brutal. You know, it's just a miserable slog. I mean, even if you are, you might hate school um but the people who at least are comprehending and enjoying reading have huge advantages and so i started to figure out um with with a lot of help um mainly from my business partner will chancellor who's kind of a genius um what's really going on when we read and how do we help someone make the leap from not being a reader to being a reader and you know you're talking here to an audience of readers, so I don't want to bore them to death, Art, <laughs> because that's one of the real um, challenges of this work is most mm-hmm. of the decision makers are in that 13%. So that number comes from a massive national study. It's about 20 years old now, but there's no reason to think that anything has changed. And it it really explains a lot if you think about it, um, because... Um, you know, we tend to be in our bubble of people who agree with us on a lot of things. Um, and um, and we tend to be in a certain bubble of uh, education level. And a lot of that is down to literacy. Um, so the ability to comprehend 
um, any of the books we just talked about, for instance, is really limited to a tiny segment of the population. I mean, there are all sorts of numbers and it's very hard to quantify exactly reading level and reading comprehension. But to me, it just explains a lot. Like if you ever post for a job and you get back, you know, th hundreds, thousands of resumes, like barely in English, you know, mm -hmm. like just full of typos. And, you know, I'm not trying to make fun of someone who's not grown up speaking English. I'm talking about native English speaking applicants who are completely terrified of any kind of writing. And so, you know, and, and the, the literacy rates kind of explain that to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so then I briefly, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and I briefly had a tech startup with a really talented um technologist and you know we built we actually started with a vocab app and then we built um a cooking app and a shared couples to do this we were just like oh whatever works and the whole time my partner was like matt you're an educator that's what you do you understand these things about learning we should do that and i thought oh, i don't see how that's how, that's never gonna sell you know <laughs> but then uh a little while ago i'm not gonna say how long because it's a long time now but <laughs> i just stuck my foot in the ground art and i decided mm -hmm. this is what matters this is the only thing i really care about um and if if we can build technology that actually uh has an impact on this that would be amazing and mm -hmm. um so i I committed to it and um, we've, we've built it and um, it's in thousands of schools and we're excited about it. It's called Zinc Reading Labs. Uh, specifically, the component is called Ignition and Ignition teaches conscious reading skills. Um, so um, I can go into what all that entails, um, but um, you know, it, it's quite a lift. It's quite a, a journey to try to figure out, like, how are we going to even interest people like in this? And, you know, when, when we we heard from you and I, oh, should I go on this podcast and talk to readers? It's a funny idea, right? Because <laughs> we're in this little bubble of people who all yeah. read, love to read. And um, we're almost isolated from the rest of the, you know, the world. And I think for teachers, for administrators, for tutors, for all of us, it's kind of like, well, didn't you read that? You know, and it's the answer is no, you know, mm -hmm. they didn't read that. Or for most people, comprehension is a very uh, skittish proposition, you mm -hmm. know, like, yeah, you're comprehending. I'm not talking about most people when they talk about literacy, they think of learning to read. And there's a big movement right now in education called science of reading, which is about you must learn phonics. It's not natural to sound out the letters. And so, and there is a, a very small percentage of teens and adults who really struggle with that. I mm -hmm. find that it's pretty easy to fix that actually for an adult, uh, but, or for a teen, you know, it has to do with brain development. Some people mm -hmm. pick up on that very early and have no problem. Other people struggle more, but everybody can learn it and it definitely needs to be taught. But it's not where you start, it's where you finish. And so if you start out, you know, uh, not comprehending when you read, you still need an upgrade and sounding out the words is not the same thing as reading any of the books in the faux library in your background. Mm, yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? These are real. <laughs> <laughs> They're real somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, you know, and that's, that is something I hear a lot, even in just our community of readers is that, um, even sometimes people will say, well, I read the book, but I can't remember anything about it. And then mm. realize I didn't comprehend that. Um, well, it, do you think that's because they didn't comprehend it or because they, they did at the time, but then just forgot it? I think that's... Well, yeah, some of them, I mean, some of it is um, like even just recent reads and, you know, that uh -huh. it, whatever reason, it just didn't, just didn't click, you know, and maybe right. I went too fast through it or something. Right, or, right, right. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. Let me give you my let me give you my conscious reading mm -hmm. explanation because it's really a bullseye for what you're talking about. I okay. think it might actually interest, especially readers who want to read more deeply. Mm -hmm. um, this is what you want to think about. So, what is reading, right? Like, what is what is the brain doing when we read? Well, number one, it's turning these little squiggles on the paper into sounds. If they're not sounds in your brain 
then they don't actually mean anything. I'm not sure how that applies to someone who's deaf. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think I've learned this and forgotten it because there's something else that you do if you're you're not processing sounds when you read, mm -hmm. you know, but you're still connecting it to whatever it is your brain understands as language. And so if you don't do that, that's the science of reading phonics, sounding it out. If you don't do that, of course you don't understand. Secondly, right alongside that, you have to know what the words mean. So if it's referencing ideas, the famous example is I could give you a very simple text about turning a double play. But if you don't know the rules of baseball, you're lost, right? So mm -hmm. those are just the, the very foundational steps of comprehension. But on top of that, the house that sits on top of that, which is the real comprehension and the pleasure of reading, consists of what we call uh, conscious reading. And there are two parts to that. Number one, zinking. Zinking means turning the words into images, ideas, experiences, meanings, right? And when we're reading, if you're reading a page turner, if you're reading Harry Potter, if you're reading something written on a middle school level or a fourth grade level, your brain doesn't read all the words. You just want to know what happens next. You might even skip whole paragraphs, right? But mm -hmm. even if you're reading them, you're just scanning forward for the plot, things with a lot of plot that really carry a lot of momentum. That's what we do when we read them, right? Now, if you're reading poetry or if you're reading something more densely written, you have to really con be converting the words as you go. And the easiest way in are the, the sensory words. So within, and we call it zinking because there's no term for it. So obviously we made up that term. Mm -hmm. You know, teachers say make the movie, but there's a lot of language that isn't a movie. It's not just visual, first of all. So when I say sensory, I mean all the senses. George Saunders talks about swimming in a pond in the rain. As soon as I hit you with that phrase, your brain is like, shunk. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're like, ah, oh, yeah. And actually, if you really let the phrase resonate in your mind, you know, it mm -hmm. becomes even more pleasurable. Right. Because mm -hmm. it's such a great thing. Um, and sitting right alongside that are what we call key images, which are really the writer's superpower. So this is the way you want to deeply engage with, you know, Zora Neale Hurston is the example I always use. Uh, ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never coming nearer, never going away till the watcher turns his eyes away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. Well, the key image in that is the ships, right? Mm -hmm. So really, really imagine ships at a distance, right? Like let that image really form in your mind. What does it feel like to you? What, what goes with that image in your mind? What thoughts and feelings go come with that image? If you really take that moment to like fully experience it, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, so imagining ships in a distance, you know, yeah. it's like a sense of adventure, maybe uh -huh. longing. Nice. Um, some of it too is uh, kind of makes me feel homesick because mm. I used to live out on the West Coast would always see the ships out in the distance. Yeah. Ah, interesting. I mean, that obviously Hurston didn't know that you used to live there, right? Mm -hmm. So that might be particular to you, but definitely there is that feeling, right? I couldn't put my finger on why does it make us feel a sense of longing, mm -hmm. right? But also a sense of adventure. Um, I don't know. I've heard a lot of different responses to that, but that's what great writing has, right? Because mm -hmm. if she had said trucks on a highway have every man's wish on board, right? That's a totally different sensory experience that the writer is giving you. So right. I would I would say that's actionable for your listeners right now. And the second part of zinking is language that is not sensory, right? Because that's where making the movie fails. And it's also where, you know, a lot of more advanced reading is just harder. So once we leave the sensory experience, which is really one of the most powerful things language can do, you know, we're in a different universe and we have to make those terms real. So if I say conscious capitalism, mm -hmm. what is that? Got me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the way you figure that out is you think, well, what does conscious mean? 
right? And what does capitalism mean? And you have associations with those terms. And those terms are like handles for all sorts of things. But if you make them fully concrete, you're on your way to actually understanding them. So the example I usually usually use is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But mm -hmm. I don't use that with you anymore because like you've already heard that and your brain immediately, oh yeah, yeah, that thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't actually consciously processes it, process it. And, you know, we were on a call yesterday working on something for Ignition, uh, the, the couple of the writers that I work with on my team, and we were working on a, th a piece from Rousseau. Um, and it was this, uh, just a little line that we're creating a teaching thing out of. And we all read it. And he says something in there about, um, he's talking about um, freedom, liberty, and equality. And um, he's saying this thing about how liberty is really important because anything that's not liberty creates dependence and uh, is a wears out the state's force. Right. And you read it and like we all read it and we all had no idea what he was talking about, you know, <laughs> and like and then we kind of waded our way in using mm -hmm. these tools. And it was funny because, you know what, it actually felt good. It mm -hmm. was like a pleasure to do that because suddenly you realize like, oh, OK, he's saying dependence. Like if you're not free as a person, you're more dependent on the state, I guess. Like, you know, the state has mm -hmm. to worry about you and care for you and stuff if you don't have your own freedom. And so it's a drag on the state's force. And who knows what he meant? I mean, it's not clear, right? It's yeah. it's it's mega real stuff. Like, does he mean like they, there's less resources for the military? Does he mean, um, I don't know, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start to actually uh, embody those words in your mind's eye, then you start to fully experience what the writer put there. So those would be my two things for your readers. One, key images, like really feel those ships at a distance. When you read, take two to five seconds. It's a Will Chancellor thing. Take two to five seconds, really form the image in your mind's eye and let the associations come to that. The thoughts, the feelings, what goes with that? Because that's the writer's magic, right? That's what makes a lot of great writing is going to be great because of that, because of the kind of like mind expanding experience that the writing creates, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. And, and then number two would be the make it real. Like make when you real. come yeah. across, when you're trying to read something, you're like, what? Like actually ask yourself, what? You know, like, okay, what could dependence mean? You know, what could the force of the government mean? Right. right. And it can't mean anything. You know, it can't mean like frogs in a boat. You know, it, right. it, mean, it could mean this or it could mean that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, see, I I love reading um, classics, you know, like especially Victorian literature. And I, I'm finding those are books you just can't race through. You know, you really got to slow down. And that's um, kind of what I find where I can be more successful at getting through a, a difficult text is um, slowing down and saying to myself, you know, what is happening here? What's going on? Do I even understand the words I'm reading? Because a lot of them, you know, well, I'll say a lot, but uh, they use quite a few words that are just out of date now. Uh -huh. And, you know, you wonder. Right. Um, well, do you stop and look those up? Uh, you, sometimes you, you usually get it from the context. Usually, right. um, I, I would say probably 90% of the time it's context kind of mm -hmm. clues, clues me in, but, um, yeah, once in a while there'll be a stubborn one and I'll <laughs> just have to look that up. You know, Art, another clue for that literature, the 19th mm -hmm. century literature. So I said there are two parts to conscious reading and zinking is the first part it's that converting the words right the mm -hmm. second part though is tracking and being able to do that over time right so what happens is you might convert the you know rousseau phrase oh that depends whatever but you've got to be doing that continuously and you've got to kind of do it in a rhythm whether it's fast or slow it has to keep going right mm -hmm. and the the surprising clue and i'm i'm i'd be curious to hear from you if you see this in your victorian literature the surprising thing is just the pronouns and they use a lot more of them in 19th century writing in general and so they they they're actually very athletic with pronouns 
Um, and I don't mean just like she, her, and they, them, and whatnot. I mean pronouns like this or that or which or thus, right? Like, and what I notice is kids just fly right by, which led to blah, blah, blah. Well, what was the which that led to the blah, blah, blah? And it's something, it typically is the antecedent comes right before the pronoun usually, but in in their their writing, sometimes it'll come after the pronoun, you know, and um, you're used to it and you probably don't notice that, but if you're getting lost, I would really suggest that as a um, tool to just slow down and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, that, which that is this? What does that refer to? That led to blah, blah, blah. What's that? Oh, okay. It's the whole idea of, you know, something or another. Well, now, now I got to try, uh, be, try to be more aware of that as I read. Now I want to see how that plays out. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, cool. Definitely. Uh, one of the other questions I wanted to ask too is then what about, um, people in our life? How can we help promote literacy and, and, uh, because like you said, it, it looks like there are kids in school that are getting through without reading, you know, as, as parents, as I know some of my listeners are teachers, some of them homeschool. I've got, I know some librarians that listen. Um, what can we do to help, to help that? Well, okay. So first off, let me shamelessly promote my product. Go for it. <laughs> we're at the infancy with this thing. I uh, we're in thousands of schools. We have a study mm -hmm. from the College Board that um, says it had a significant impact on PSAT scores. Uh, I think it's much better than when they did the study. But um, you know, it's an effort. It's not an easy tool to use, but we do um, make it available to homeschoolers, to schools. We'd love to hear from anyone who's interested in any kind of partnership. It's not, it, I mean, we're trying to make money, but we lose money every year now. I mean, we'd like to <laughs> turn the corner on that. And, um, you know, we will um, work with you. If, you. if you're a librarian and you think you can get people to actually, you know, who are motivated, who want to sit, it takes several hours and has to be done over a couple of weeks, ideally, right? Like you can't just sit for two hours and go through ignition. You can, um, some people have, and they get a lot out of it, but basically it's inculcating the skills that we just talked about that come totally naturally to you and me. Mm -hmm. So on a less self-serving level to answer your question, I think the number one thing I would, and, and I, I'm not, you know, uh, I want to be self-serving here because I do think it's an amazing, amazing product mm -hmm. and it will transform the world once we figure out how to get people motivated to do it. So also, if anybody has any ideas about that, you can shoot me an email, matt at zinclearninglabs.com, uh, Z-I-N-C. Um, but aside from that, what I hope your listeners are taking away from our conversation is number one, just understand that if you're a successful reader, most people are not like you. They're not having the same experience you are. And so if you're trying to help someone, let's say you're, you know, volunteering and you're tutoring a kid or an adult and you're trying to help them read something, use the tools we just talked about. Like, first of all, don't assume that they get it. I promise you they don't. Like anyone who doesn't like reading, like, why do you like reading? I would say, because you can, you know, like if you, yeah. if you, if you don't comprehend when you read, it's an awful experience, mm -hmm. right? So understand if you're trying to help someone else, it's probably the case that they're not experiencing it the way you do. And just give them the tools that I just gave you. Zinking, mm -hmm. turning the words into images, ideas, meanings, understanding that the sensory words are the easiest and the more abstract words are much more effort. It's it's a much bigger cognitive load when you read, right? Mm -hmm. More complex sentences, tracking, you know, the pronouns, navigator words, like although, however, things like that, asides, oh my God, and the Victorian novels, like most people are going to be completely stumped by that. So mm -hmm. just be patient and look to figure out what's going to unlock it for them. The other thing I would say is you got it has to be interesting. So that's the other thing that's hard about this. Like <laughs> yeah. if I gave your favorite Victorian novel, what is your favorite Victorian novel? Um well right now, right now. yeah, right now it's probably uh 
Tale of Two Cities uh, by oh. Dickens. Oh. I, I'm a big fan you're of big, Charles Dickens. Dickens. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> cool. Um, so, you know, if you gave like a nice meaty sentence that you think is amazing to like the average American teenager, mm -hmm. they'll just be bored out of their skull. I mean, number one, they're not understanding it. So that's a problem. But even if they did understand it, like, I don't know, you have to try to figure out what would connect for them. So, you know, I'm always looking for the right text that, you know, really lights that fire. Because mm -hmm. so the here's the secret sauce, Art. It's giving them the the zinking and tracking tools, but doing it at a, with a text that is, you know, above their level. That's a reach, right? But that delivers rewards. Like if it's a reach to read this uh, tax law, you know, um, and you successfully figure out what the difference is between the Iowa code and the Nebraska code for uh, personal income tax are, you know, like that's not very fulfilling to most people, mm -hmm. right? But if they read Tale of Two Cities and then they're blown away by the idea of like the French Revolution or whatever, you know, then you've got them. And then you've just created a reader. So mm -hmm. you wanna make them have a successful experience and also get them comprehending. Conscious reading, you know, is the only way to have a successful reading experience. Yeah, no, I'm, thinking of you know the opening chapter of that book you know it's it was the best of times it was the worst of times and it's just this whole page of contradictions like that describing the time period and now, I, now I'm, I'm curious as to how a, a modern teenager would would <laughs> approach that or, or I've think not about tried that. that with a modern teenager honestly <laughs> so i'll let you know if i do okay what yeah. do you think do you think they well what's in it for them you know, I, I mean, it would depend as, as a teenager, you know, I would have, firstly, I would have seen it as a, a challenge, like, okay, uh, this is supposedly good. What's good about it. Let me, let me, uh -huh. let me tackle it, you know? And, uh -huh. and I, I mean, in some level, I speak from a, a position of, I, I guess, privilege in that sense that I had people in my life encouraging me to read and helping me find good books to read and, all that. And I know not everybody. Were you always a reader? Were you a reader as a kid? Yeah. Yeah. My, my grandma got me, I mean, she found the Hardy boys would uh -huh. send me Hardy boy books and I just devour them. And then, <laughs> yeah, I had you those. know, yeah. Then what else is there to read? And then it just kind of ignites, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, well, that's the thing is like, also another thing is like parents, if they're trying to push their kids, don't do that. You know, if they're yeah. reading Captain Underpants, let them read that. You know, like they'll get bored with it eventually and then they'll want to read, you know, something mm -hmm. meatier and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully you can find that for them. I my I have uh, two boys when they were younger, they they found the uh, the Magic Treehouse books that, uh, you know, not any great works of literature by far, but it excited them about reading and there were about now, 800 of them i think yeah yeah <laughs> exactly and they just devour them through the library you know <laughs> uh -huh. and, and we couldn't we couldn't keep them in books for a while they were just reading so much because it's something about um it was like their gateway i guess you know they they saw that reading could be enjoyable and then they went out and to try to find more that they would find enjoyable uh, uh to read and we homeschooled them for quite a while. And then when my oldest son, he, he went to a public school, he started uh, for his ninth grade. And one of the teachers during our parent teacher conference said, uh, he was surprised when he found out that he was homeschooled. He said, I, I couldn't believe it. He, he, you know, that my oldest son, he said he, he was so well read and so well spoken and all this, you know, and um, he just, Right. ran circles around the other students and well that actually gets us to a separate arena of the whole zinc universe which is what we call love-based learning and mm -hmm. you know a lot of times that's something that's going on for homeschooled kids um i mean i don't know if that was your experience but my from yeah. parents i know homeschooled like it's love-based you know you're 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 tackling stuff that actually interests your kid and you understand somehow intuitively that that's what drives successful learning. And unfortunately school is fear-based. It's the opposite experience and it does, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. 
It's a bigger problem, <laughs> yeah. but it really doesn't work. It it works perfectly for pretty much no one, you yeah. know. So, um, uh, and so when your kid got there, I'm sure it was a shock to him to find other kids who were like, "Oh yeah, I have to do this awful blah blah blah." Yeah, you know? and um, yeah. Well, I, and you know, I the come bigger across, change. come across people all the time that you know. Say, oh, I hate reading. And, and to me, yeah. that's a, such a foreign thought, but, you know, I got to remember, okay, your experience is different. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, mean, I always it makes perfect sense. Like, can you, yeah. do you like reading, you know, um, I don't know, in a language you don't understand? I mean, that's too right. extreme, but like, well, you know, like, uh, I was just thinking, you know, if I picked up a, like a car manual or something, you know, like an engine manual, uh, like this is boring. I have, <laughs> and, right, and, or something about like cricket. You know, right. Like even yeah. The best thing written about a sport that you don't know anything about, but that's more about understanding the the context and the, mm -hmm. the cultural background. It's it's even deeper than that, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. You know. And I even wonder when you say that, like, yeah, there are all these series now. Like my kids got into Percy Jackson, and then of course Harry Potter, and mm -hmm. the publishing industry has figured out like adults buy YA novels right? Because they mm -hmm. can't comprehend on an adult level. So they're not going to read the Victorian novels that you are enjoying, but they're going to read, you know, uh, John Green. Like that's very popular because it's, you know, exciting, interesting mm -hmm. stories, addresses things. Um, you know, my friend Jody Pico writes on a, it's a level that a middle schooler can understand, but those, those books are bought by adults you know, and I'm not knocking them. They're great. You know, that's great. But in terms of your deepening of your pleasure and of your learning, I'm convinced like I was like you, I came from a very literate background and people were giving me things to read and demanding that I read. But I read like historical fiction and stuff. Mm -hmm. I read some Hardy Boys when I was a kid. <laughs> Encyclopedia Brown was the thing. Oh, yeah. I'm excited about, you know, but but I wish that someone had made me read, you know, Dickens or uh anything more advanced in high school because i think it's really good for your teenage brain art mm -hmm. um and i think i it would have made me smarter to do that mm -hmm. and so i try to do things like that now even as an adult i try to read things that are hard as long as they're interesting mm -hmm. you know none of the books i recommended was those are all like relaxing interesting reads but um sometimes i'll try to read like uh something more philosophical or something about you know neuroscience or whatever and it's a slog but it's worth it really, do you yeah. ever do that what's that do you ever do that yeah um i mean that's in some ways why i got into reading old classics um i it's weird because when i finished high school i thought all right i need to do something epic i'm gonna read moby dick you know, I don't know why I picked Moby Dick, but I just said, you know, that's, I hear that as a classic. I'm, this is going to be my big challenge to myself. You know, I will nice. read Moby Dick and I'll become an adult, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, uh, it, yeah, it took me about two or three months to get through that book, but I made it and didn't always figure out what, what was happening, but it, it, I like to push myself. And, and so that kind of, uh, I enjoy that process of, of, pushing myself when I read and, and that, okay, you know, this is really easy to understand. So what else can I read? You know, what, what mm. else can I go? Um, Were you able to impart that to your kids at all? I, I think so. At least, at least two of them. Um, my, uh -huh. my, my daughter is still struggling with finding the, the joy of reading that, that we have. Uh, but she's in eighth grade right now and her, um, English uh, language arts teacher. Uh, she's teaching literature this this semester, and uh, I mean, she's had him read. Um, oh, what, what what were some of them? Uh, she wrote. She read a couple of Ray Bradbury short stories uh, that she really enjoyed. Hmm. Um, there's a couple other young adult novels she read that she really enjoyed, and uh, you know, I I could see her getting passionate about those stories. Uh, some of them had really sad endings, and she, she said my whole table was crying by the end of the story and wow <laughs> but wow but they were engaged with the story and you know and i was so excited to, to hear that you know i'm sorry you had to cry but 
<laughs> you know, you, you got so caught up in the story that it moved you, you know, that's, that's neat. Yeah. I mean, crying's good. I, I, I don't think, that, honestly, I didn't really, I was an English major in college, but I didn't really become a reader till after college, yeah. um, you know, in a certain way. I mean, I read, obviously I had to read and stuff, but it was like kind of a chore. And then I didn't mm -hmm. realize like, and, and the other thing I just want to say about that is like, you know, it sounds like your daughter is figuring it out. And for your listeners, like, do not panic about your kid. Just keep it positive. Keep the stimulus on. Try to find the thing that's going to, you know, switch them on to reading and get excited about it because the brain develops at different rates. And, um, you know, they say that boys tend to develop slower than girls. I don't know how that's tied to, you know, sex uh, uh, or whatever. And, right. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm dubious about a lot of that stuff. But, you know, just just keep it positive. Like, don't be in a panic or give up. And I talk to a lot of adults who like, oh, yeah, I love reading. When did you start loving in college? You know, after college, mm -hmm. um, you can discover reading at any point in your life. And the key thing is that it be positive, right? Like, if it's just like a punishment, like, oh, you have to read, you know, and it was kind of presented to me that way, I think, when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I managed to find things that, you know, you get sucked into a book. Of course, now it's much harder for kids because they have these things in their pockets that are, you know, yeah, the like gumball machines for the brain. So, right, right. Um, that's that's a whole other conversation there, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Look, reading is one of the antidotes to it. Yeah, you know, it's and we all need antidotes to it. So, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Matt, thank you so much for for coming on and, and just t talking about reading and literacy and all that you're doing. Um, it, so if folks want to check out your website and, and your product and all that, where, where should I send them? They should go to zincleaninglabs.com, Z-I-N-C, learninglabs.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter, but I, I mean, whatever, I'm going to start doing more of that. Matt Bardeen, B-A-R-D-I-N, uh, m-a-t-t-b-a-r-d-i-n and uh we're zinc learning labs on instagram and stuff like that as well all right well i will make sure those uh links and information's in our show notes so folks can check those out and uh I, again matt i just want to thank you for uh, coming on the show today and and sharing your passion with us my pleasure thanks for having me art yep take care okay so long